get you guys demonetized. You know what I mean? If you put oh, it whatever. on uh, YouTube. So, I think that, like, I think that, that, uh, I think that casting couch you have in the background is going to get us demonetized. Look at that thing. <laughs> Yo, man, don't, 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 don't tell people how you make ends meet. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you're, you're leaking out too much information here. <laughs> so this is what you've been doing the last few months. <laughs> Yo, what do you think this ring light is for, man? What do you think I got all the goods for? <laughs> Second you think question. It's for virtual tra- virtual training on Zoom? Come on, man. You don't. Oh, that. so that's what you call your OnlyFans account. <laughs> virtual virtual trainings on Zoom dot uh, dot com. Only dot OnlyFans.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that's just the cover up, guys. Come on. Come on. I don't know. I'll be honest. Uh we me and me and Aaron were struggling. Can't all these sneakers. <laughs> me and Aaron were struggling for a uh, while. Training. We were thinking about uh thinking about an OnlyFans account as well. <laughs> oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah, we, we haven't we haven't got market yet, out there. But we're yeah. we're thinking about it. it. It's highly probable. There has to be there has to be a market there for uh guys with fetishes for used geese, like somewhere out there in the market, there has to be, you know, I rolled in this gi like how many times? Oh, there's been some <laughs> stories about, um, so speaking of which, there's been some, uh, we'll, we'll kick it off. So there's been some stories about, um, there's a gentleman who actually approached me like pre uh, pandemic, like really nice guy. When I first met him, his name was, I'm, I'm going to leave his name out of it, but like for the people that know this story, they'll know who it is. Um, so there was a gentleman who actually came to the gym that we don't speak of. Uh, he came, actually came up to the, the desk that we have normally. He was asking about jujitsu and thinking about doing privates. And he's like, he's like, Hey, I'm not a member here, but I, I get my hair cut here from time to time. I'm interested in, you know, I've seen jujitsu. Uh, I'm interested in trying it sometime. Um, do you guys offer that here? And I said, you know, I do like me and my, myself and I, and there's another instructor named Aaron. We also, we, we co-teach a, a jujitsu class here. He's like, yeah, I'm thinking about like maybe starting out, like maybe doing like some privates and maybe like some one-on-one training. I'm like, okay, I'll get your number. So then I started talking to him like by text back and forth. So I'm like, Hey, you know, like, what are your goals? Like, what do you like, you know, the, the standard, like personal trainer talk, like, Hey, what are your goals? Like, what do you want to accomplish with this? And he's just like, Hey, you know, like I've always been interested in like, you know, doing jujitsu, but like, you know, I've always been a little shy and I'm like, no, it's okay, man. There's nothing wrong with like, you know, being shy. Like it's sometimes like, you know, it's, it, it, things are new and like, you know, it's hard to get into. He's like, he's like, I, I'm asking, but uh, like, I'm shy. Like I want to do it, but like, do you guys have like a private room at lifetime? And I'm like, no, I don't think so. But like, we have like an open area, like nobody really cares like what you're doing or watching. He's like, no, like, he's like, also like, He's like, I'm kind of shy, but like, I also want to train shirtless with another <laughs> dude. And I'm like, okay, that's okay. You know, that suit yourself. He's like, he's like, I really want to learn grounded pound. I want another man on top of me, just <laughs> punching me and choking me and punching me. He's like, I want to learn that. And I'm like, I just said, Hey, you know what? This is going to be a really difficult uh, scheduling you in for this. Uh, I may have somebody that may be interested in doing this with you. And then like literally 10 seconds later, Hey Aaron, I may have somebody who wants to do privates with you. Here's their contact. And you should, and you should call them. But like, and here's the thing. Mike neglects to actually transfer any of this information over to me. So I had, I contacted the guy. I didn't neglect like, it, Aaron. I didn't neglect it at all. Actually. <laughs> like, so Aaron so, was open to the idea. Okay. Well, I didn't know. Right? I don't so judge. It's cool. It's 2020. Well, and I get the same <laughs> bullshit, and I'm like, "What the fuck is this?" And I'm like, I, and, I, "And again, he hadn't explained. Oh, I want to do shirtless. I want to do no gi yet, or whatever. I just want a private area." I'm like, "Okay, he just doesn't want to train at lifetime, right?" So that's why I'm thinking. So I'm like, "Okay, let me." Oh, see you if mentioned I can find... the gym, Aaron. What the? What? Come on, uh, man. I, I'll, I'll edit it out. You have to edit it out. Later. Later. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you do it. I'm like, and, and I, he doesn't want to train at the club. And I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take him to um, Evo or something like that. I'll train him there. And then, so I'm thinking about it. I'm like, this just, and then he's just going on and on. I'm like, this is fucked up. So I contact Dave and I'm like, Dave, like, do you know about this guy? He's like, have this guy ever come to train? He's like, don't worry about that fucking guy. That guy's fucking crazy. Don't contact him again. I'm like, oh, fuck this. I'm like, <laughs> 
So, like, apparently he thought, like, oh my around, like, the neighborhood trying to get guys to grapple with them and all that kind of stuff. It, it's uh, it, it's an interesting conversation. I it's am, awesome. but a oh, humble wow. washing machine salesman. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. Say, so this guy went from place to place, person to person, club to club, wanting this service. Like Basically. shirtless grappling grounded pound service. Wow. I'm surprised you didn't upsell them in KY Jelly there, Aaron. I'm surprised. <laughs> I, it was not. <laughs> no, I haven't scooped that low yet. <laughs> Aaron was this close to doing gay for pay. This close. No, uh, not at all. Oh not at all. But, uh, hey, no, Jeff, judgment, to... no judgment, man. No judgment. I, I was also, during the last few months on Serb, this close as well. <laughs> Yeah. But then, again, I get, understand the pandemic has kind of put people in interesting situations to kind of make income. Um, I'm not quite there yet. Maybe Mike has maybe gotten there, but I haven't gotten there yet. No, I haven't. Hey, man, if you I see ever, the couch in the those back, opportunities, man. I'll be more than happy to uh, SNS them to Aaron Gall. <laughs> wow. Jeff has some call, casting call, coach call, in the call, back, which is amazing. Work. Sorry, say that again, Jeff. So I call it contract work. There you go. I have a contractor just for you, Aaron Gal. Just sign it up. You got the guy working for you. There you go. Onlyfans.com. Yeah, okay. What other sponsors do we have, Aaron? I know we've been working on a lot of things actually behind the scenes the last week, week and a half or so. Is that your cat down there? That is my cat, yeah. That is your cat. So, what is, it, what is the name is, of your cat? My cat's name is Chanel. She's a little troublemaker. So Chanel, she's, uh, she's, Coco she's Chanel, out. Coco Chanel over here. So that is uh, Rachel's uh, Rachel's cat that has now been officially adopted by myself. But um, yeah, she likes to hang out with me during the podcast now. So, uh, oh, as far as the other sponsors go, um, I'm not really going to reveal those just yet. We're going to reveal them on the next podcast just because we're finalizing the details and I want to make sure that we have all the details, all the information appropriate for everybody so they can actually take advantage of everything as well. We actually have a lot of, uh, a lot of things we were working on behind the scenes the last couple of weeks. And I think we actually may have potentially two or three more big sponsors that are coming on board. Possibly three, possibly three. So possibly three. really exciting. So really exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. So tune into the next podcast. We should have more information on that. Or not. Just tune in and uh, listen to me and Aaron ramble on about nothing. Yeah. So definitely want to thank Jeff for joining us today. So Jeff, um, how you been, man? It's been quite a while since we've had a chance to kind of work together. But obviously you've been really busy keeping education, working with in different individuals. So kind of tell us how things have been going so far. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here on this podcast. And yeah, I've been keeping myself busy, um, mostly doing virtual training uh, through Zoom. Um, and I do private stuff. And um, that's one way I've been keeping myself busy for sure is taking those one-on-one -on -one clients and training them through this medium, which at first was kind of weird um, because I'm used to being very hands-on with people because I do facial stretch therapy as well. And um, when you work in a fitness facility, you have all the tools to your disposal. Now you're kind of at the mercy of, okay, what does this person have at home? <laughs> and uh, from that, you're just trying to almost visualize yourself in their space and kind of training them like through this medium. So uh, at first, it was a little bit weird, but now I've kind of adapted, and it's keeping my mind sharp, and that's one thing that I found the advantage of, of taking on clients privately via this medium, but in terms of work, that's kind of really about what I've been doing. Um, I kind of picked up uh, my uh, holistic nutrition program again and finalizing myself graduating from that program, which has been taking way too long. I've just been pushing that program way too far but I'm literally like a few case studies in a course behind from being a registered holistic nutritionist, which I could just add on to the, to the repertoire of what I do. But uh, aside from that, that's really what I've been uh, trying to keep myself busy with. Aside from now, you know, before the pandemic hit, I moved into a house. So now I'm learning all the ins and outs of taking care of a yard and all that shit, like, <laughs> and all that extra work that comes with all of a sudden having a home now. But, uh, yeah, that's really what I've been keeping myself busy with. Um, 
kind of reigniting my love for cooking again and all that jazz. Uh, I kind of fell back from being, you know, a busy personal trainer working for a corporate gym. But like now um, I'm more in tune with those things. So, you know, I keep myself busy during these times. You know, I haven't really stepped in back into a gym really. Uh, I think I did like one ply session with uh, Ralkie over there uh, one time, but uh, that's about it. But most of my workouts and stuff have been at home and all that jazz. So that's what I've been doing. That's what I've been doing. All, all that jazz? Are you stealing one of Aaron's sayings? No, it's my life. I didn't know it's one of Aaron's life. sayings. <laughs> oh, Jeff, I want to ask you, what's – um, so virtual training versus, like, training somebody in person. Um, go into a little bit more detail with that. Like, what are the – what are the differences you find between like training somebody in person versus training somebody virtual? What are some of maybe the strengths and weaknesses of each one? Cause it's something that's really kind of came, uh, it's a lot more mainstream now, especially like since you know, COVID and the uh, pandemic and everything where you're not physically in front of somebody training them. Like there was like online training and things that have come up in the last, like, you know, few years or so, but they've gotten an, especially a lot more popular this year based on what's happening. Yeah. So several things. Um, I was doing a little bit of R&D into what a lot of clubs are doing along the the GTA area. And um, there's a lot of people doing virtual classes, which is which is great. Uh, They have small group training, all that kind of jazz. See that a lot on Zoom. Um, But virtual privates where it's just one on one on Zoom and you're trying to cue someone through pretty much a camera. That's something that's uh, not so much there, but um, some major differences, obviously you're not physically there at their space. Like for someone that like me, that's really used to using tactile cues and hand on cues, um, that's obviously not there. So you can't really physically go, hey, I want you to feel it here and give them a tactile cue of whatever muscle group you want so they can make that mind muscle connection. Like that's not there. And for me, who's someone who does like fascial stretch therapy, that's totally just all hands on, right? You're physically. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you can't someone stretch somebody table. with your mind through the yeah. camera. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously the, the, the other thing that's different is like, um, like I've only trained people in commercial gyms. Like I was never an in-home trainer. So another thing I had to adapt to is, hey, this is the equipment that you have. Okay, so it's just a band and a few dumbbells. Okay, what can they do for the next 50 minutes to an hour to construct a full body workout or an isolated workout for you? Um, that was another thing on top of, of everything um, that I had to adapt to doing training. But um, what it did do though, was take me kind of back to my grassroots of when I started my own fitness journey, which is literally in my basement with a few dumbbells, a mat, a stability ball, and kind of remembering in the past that I was still able to, to achieve some goals and still able to transform my body, uh, focusing on like nutrition and all that kind of jazz. It just kind of took me back there. And I started like, t- yeah, started pulling things off in the memory banks and starting to be a little bit more creative. And I was nowhere near as educated back then than I am now. So it's kind of like creating an amalgamation of all those things. Okay, so what do I, knowledge I have now? What knowledge do I have then? And what can I create for this person on the other side of the camera? So. Oh, he's frozen. Uh-oh. Oh, oh. oh. oh he's frozen. We I lost you for a second. You were trapped on the casting couch. Yeah, yeah. go back. <laughs> Am I back? What were you yet? saying? Yeah, go back Am like back 30 seconds, 10 seconds. You're back now. 10 seconds? Okay. No, like, so now I'm using a lot more uh, visual cues. So I'm doing a lot more demoing, lots more demoing of showing exercises, a lot of more uh, verbal cues um, and all tactile cues. And now I'm just telling people to put their hands on the muscle group that I want them to go on. You know what I mean? So in a way, I'm almost empowering people to, to kind of educate themselves, to take uh, action on their own terms into doing things that they can do themselves. So in a way, like, there, there's just advantages and disadvantages to everything, right? Like, but for someone like me, like I like being in front of someone. I like doing circle checks around somebody doing stuff. But now I'm telling people just to give me different camera angles and all that kind of jazz so I can see their form and technique. You know, it's, it's just different. 
But in the end of the day, you're still having a one-on-one -on -one connection with somebody. So that's good. You're still having genuine conversation with somebody that's good and you're just helping people. So that's fine. Uh, the thing for me that just kind of sucks is just, I haven't had someone like on the table for me to stretch since this whole thing kicked off. So mm -hmm. those skill sets may be kind of like rusty and doing any, any table work with the rehab or prehab process, like that kind of uh, gets a little bit lost. Like there's like, I do work on Ralki, but like that's, that's one body versus yeah. the multitude of different bodies I have my hands on. So either way, like I look at the fact that I'm, I'm still utilizing my skill set, still helping people. Uh, so that's okay on a positive sense. And I just always want to kind of think, think positive and uh, try to look at that opportunity there because um, it's a somewhat, not, I want to say untapped, but definitely I don't see a lot of people doing that one-on-one -on -one service uh, via this medium. So let me ask you, because I know you're a big advocate for um, fascial stretch therapy and manual-based therapy. So obviously there's so many different types of therapy that individuals can go with and whether it be acupuncture, massage, chiro, whatever, right? Um, why would you say like that is kind of the medium that you kind of selected where like this is effective and it works for you based off that? And it's for some people that might not know what fascial stretch therapy is, kind of just give them a little brief rundown what that might be. Okay, so to understand fascial stretch therapy, it's uh, good to understand fascia itself. So fascia is a like a connected tissue that kind of surrounds everything in the body. So it attaches everything to everything else. So for people that look at classic anatomy, you know, your bicep is separated from your tricep, separated from the quad. When you look at the fascia, it's like an envelope that surrounds everything. So if you have an area that's restricted, let's say along the shoulder, from the myofascia that is, um, that can definitely have an effect somewhere else in the body, right? So when someone complains, hey, I have hip tightness or hip pain, or vice versa, I have shoulder pain or shoulder tightness, um, when you look at, at things myofascially, um, you can actually address somebody's hip or vice versa, address somebody's shoulder, and you can have some crossover benefits in terms of uh, pain reduction or a loosening of those other areas, right? So it is a tissue that seems to surround everything, every cell in the body. So how I stumbled upon uh, fascial stretch therapy was many years ago. And I wasn't even an advocate for stretching generally. Like before I even got into the myofascial world, I studied a lot of it before I even jumped in. I think I knew about it in 2009 or 2010 where uh, people in my area were learning it. And I wasn't even for it. I wasn't even for it. Um, I was more into the whole muscle activation technique thing, uh, where, you know, muscle tightness is secondary to muscle weakness. So I was, I was in that little bit of mindset and that was more of the time where I was a little bit more, um, narrow-minded and a little bit more arrogant at, at that time, um, where I thought stretching was, you know, you're deactivating tissues, uh, you're creating weaknesses in the body. You're not doing anything, uh, beneficial. Um, but Honestly, the more I studied, the more I learned over the years, it took me about four or five years of trying to learn uh, anatomy and myofascia more before I actually got bought in into myofascia uh, stretching. And I say stretching, quote unquote, because I don't think a myofascia could be stretched because it has like a tensile strength of a car door. So I don't think you can stretch it, but you can make it pliable. But then, you know, the more research I read about and the more you know, client feedback and, and, and benefits I saw among just general population athletes, then I was pretty much bought in. So it took about four or five years for me to jump in to the faster stretch therapy world, you know, but before that I was still doing all the stuff that I was doing in terms of rehab or injury prevention, all that kind of stuff, just other means. But uh, I didn't step into that world because I thought one thing was better than the other. Um, I stepped into that world because it fell into the scope of practice of a personal trainer. You know what I mean? Like, um, uh, if I wanted to do other forms of manual therapy, then maybe I'd have to jump back to school to become a physiotherapist or massage therapist, which I was actually considering at one point, 
thinking about, okay. you know, I want to study therapy. So I'm going to go and study massage therapy. But um, at the time, then I'd had to pretty much quit being a PT and go to uh, massage therapy full time because uh, I wanted to go to the best uh, massage therapy school. But I didn't see that as an option because I was like, I was living on my own. And I was like, you know what, this is not an option for me. So let me explore this. So that's how I ended up landing on facial stretch therapy. And, um, and it's a great service on its own, but it's also a great service in conjunction with other therapies, which I think plays a large part in being someone that is a injury uh, prevention and rehab specialist is to be well-rounded in knowing other fields of treatment. So you can work synergistically with those things. Let's uh, rewind a little bit. How did you actually even get into like personal training and like helping people? Let's kind of take you through like your kind of your background, your journey, where you started oh, God. up until now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So that was, that was even an accident to be honest. It was an accident. Like I graduated from U of T from their kinesiology program. I had no fucking idea what I wanted to do. I was land thinking of an idea of what field of therapy I wanted to go to. And for the time being, I'm like, I want to use, I utilize my degree. I just don't want to do anything. So I guess I find myself as a personal trainer to the National Strength and Conditioning Association because I heard that was a good place to get a PT cert. So I went there, I got my CSCS as well. And um, yeah, I, I started applying for PT jobs and I land, landed one at a, a commercial gym. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try this for a year, you, you know, get some experience, get into the field and we'll see what happens. And then 12 years later, you know, I'm still doing it. So um, it's interesting. Like, it doesn't matter how many times I think that, okay, I'm going to go do something else. You know, I'm going to go do massage therapy. I'm going to go do chiropractic or whatever. Um, I always get pulled back, you know what I mean? That's either my client list, this builds up or, you know, something big race me gets me excited in the field. Something changes and evolves that gets me engaged. And um, I kind of get let life kind of do its thing at some times. And it just keeps reel reeling me back in. Like even during this time here, I'm just like, I could just, I could just leave and forget this whole thing. And then uh, the virtual training thing just kind of landed on my lap and I'm just like, okay, now I'm doing virtual. So it seems to always just keep coming back. Once and you think you're out, they pull people. you right yeah, back I, in. Yeah, they pull you in. Yeah, because yeah, all I really want to do is help people in some way, shape or form. And this was a medium for me to do that. It was a medium for me to connect with people in various different ways, meet cool people and I don't know. I just, like I said, just keeps pulling me back in here. I am 12 years later thinking I was only going to do it for one. And that's where I am. And the whole injury prevention thing and rehab thing, that was solely because no one in my club at the time had any background in kinesiology. So early on in the, in, in the days, like there were no real systems. Say, like every, it was really the wild, wild west, especially in my gym. Like people were just doing whatever they wanted with their clients. So if the 300 workout was the thing to do, the 300 workout <laughs> is exactly what every fucking client <laughs> did. So, so, so like, you know, like a six year old lady with sciatica, you're doing 50 fucking barbell deadlifts <laughs> for whatever reason. Right? So that's what they were, were doing. No, that's what they were doing. And this I'm is Sparta. Lift this yeah, dumbbell, exactly. you pussy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, here I am with my uterine education thinking I'm fucked up, right? I'm like, man, I'm doing something wrong here because everyone else is here doing freaking uh, old school <laughs> CrossFit wads where it was just a, just a website and um, doing this 300 workout. And I'm just like, well, my uni university education was wrong, you know, program design and all this kind of stuff. But uh, program design, we actually on, design programs. Why don't I just do this? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Why don't you just copy you know, something like, off the like, internet? Like, like honestly, the, your 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 validation of a good job was whether you made your client vomit that day, and that was it. <laughs> that was just your only job. It's like make them vomit, and that's it. You you got a thumbs up. I remember being in one of my orientations when I when I first got hired in this corporation. Like one of the girls there was like, 
oh, my client vomited. Oh, he threw up. And everyone in the room was clapping like, whoa. And I was like, what the fuck is going on, right? <laughs> but uh, that's how it was then. And as time went on, uh, trainers got a little bit more education. Programming and periodization became a thing. And I was a little bit ahead of the curve. You know, I started getting clients passed on to me that were like injured and kind of messed up from the other trainers. And I was applying <laughs> some strategic programming. Jeez. Yeah, like, yeah. So I, th they were just passed on to me. And, but the thing is, even with someone who, with a degree in kinesiology, like I wasn't that confident. You know what I mean? They didn't teach me that much, like basic biomechanics, but in terms of other things. So I was pulling up research articles and stuff like that to handle things like knee pain, different protocols and whatnot. And um, as time went on, like I became the go-to guy for this kind of stuff. Like, oh, so this person has knee problems, go see Jeff. This person had back problems, neck problems, go see Jeff. And that's kind of how it was. So I was kind of learning on the fly. At the same time, all, all these courses were coming out. And I just kept paying into these things and trying to learn more. And, um, and I found it interesting. It was really engaging. It was like uh, solving Rubik's cubes all the time. So for me, so it kept me really interested with my clients. And um, that's kind of just how I landed in the spot as uh, the person deals with uh, prehab, rehab and injury prevention. So like, I remember like all the days of the wild west and I think they still happen depending on certain facilities. <laughs> like what's kind of like the, the, the wildest story you've heard. And Mike, I know you got a bunch from your other like premier days and all that kind of stuff. So. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll share some stories. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I thought the wildest story is like, we had this wild fitness manager at the time and um <laughs> And this is a time where, um, you know, functional training was really, really popular. So that just meant let's do anything on an unstable surface as crazy as possible. And that was considered <laughs> functional. At the time. That's still so, a thing. That's still yeah. a thing. <laughs> so, so you got, you got like his newbie client, right? And we're watching in the morning and I'm wa walking in around 6 a.m. And one of my buddies was on the uh, other side of the gym and he calls me, he's like, Jeff. Jeff, look, look. And he's pointing at one of the squat racks. And I look, and it's my fitness manager, right? Loaded barbell. I forget how much weight. No clips on it. Loaded barbell. Laying his client on the racket. This is a newbie client. Walk backwards to step on top of the BOSU ball, black side up. So it's like oh. wobbly as fuck. <laughs> Trying to stand on top of it, right? You know, he's not like spotting him. He's just watching him from a distance, right? As this is happening. I'm just like, what the fuck is happening right now? And he's just like wobbling and stuff. And there's no clips and everything. And I'm just like, oh my God, what the hell is going on? But um, yeah, that was a time when like the more unstable a surface area is, the better it is for you. And <laughs> I was like, at, the, at this time. gym, I don't know at, what you do. Got. They still teach these things. And is the name of the gym start with good and end in life? <laughs> Uh, unfortunately yeah unfortunately yeah no they don't teach that stuff anymore they don't that was that was that was far 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 back far back before they even had any real uh training and development back then but uh no no so i don't know if you got any more wild stories than that but love to hear them well mike used yeah. to work for premier which is like one of the prime um establishments in canada at one point uh, I, I didn't unfortunately i never worked for them so i'll let uh michael speak about them. I, I did work for them in their uh their i guess you can say when the sun was setting on them so uh because oh. <laughs> but they they were actually like the biggest gym like at one point this was like maybe like the mid to late 2000s so like 2007 8 9 like around there, like they were the gym because they had, they had gyms in like Sky Dome at the time. They had gyms in like downtown Toronto. They had like all over the GTA and they were like one of the biggest, yeah. biggest chains that, that existed at that time. And I started with them and that was like my first like, like personal training gig job, whatever you want to call it. And like, I'm just like you, I'm learning on the fly. So I go. I think I remember my first day there it was like a half an hour. I was like, 
hey, do you want to go train this guy? And I'm like, uh, sure, I'll show him some stuff. And then, like, I didn't, like, absolutely murder him or anything, but it's just, like, I was just showing him stuff that I did, like, pretty much for, like, with my training. I'm just like, hey, like, it was a younger guy, kind of, like, around my age at the time. I'm like, hey, like, so, like, you know, like, what do you want to work on? Like, what are your goals? Talking to him about it. So I was, like, showing him, like, you know, battle ropes and random, like, functional training stuff as well. I unfortunately did not uh, get him to do uh, – squats on a bosu ball i don't think i was doing anything that crazy i think at that point i think i was in more into like like kind of like powerlifting strength training where it's just like oh you got a bad knee start deadlifting you want to <laughs> you want to it's like oh you want to lose 100 pounds start deadlifting <laughs> oh you want to get stronger start dead it's like it's like whatever the solution was it's just like hey i'm gonna run a half marathon start deadlifting <laughs> like it di didn't matter what the goal was it's like we're gonna do this <laughs> but like i think every kind of trainer kind of falls into that trap or mindset like you even mentioned that for yourself like when you started out you're sometimes people are a little closed-minded and they're like hey like like this is the style of training that I want you to do versus like kind of listening to the who is in front of you and kind of listening to like what they want to accomplish and then kind of putting together kind of like a, I guess like a roadmap to like, all right, well, this is how you're going to get here. It's going to be a combination of a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But uh, the one thing I definitely learned at Premier was uh, how to not do business with people because they were... <laughs> <laughs> kind of the reason why people have like a bad reputation or a bad taste when it comes to like big chain gyms because like towards like my end of my tenure there and I was I wasn't there like really really long like in the in hindsight I was maybe there maybe about a year and a half two years but like towards that end there was like almost like every week somebody was coming in like hey you billed me three times for my membership what the f is going on it's like, there's like their bank statement. It's like, hey, I canceled a year ago. You've charged me 14 times since then. Like, you're not even charging me once a month. You Sometimes you charge me twice. I don't even know what's going on. I would see like, like mm -hmm. even clients or other people, they would have like their benefits run. So like somebody would come in because there was like a clinic there as well. A, a clinic. For those who are this, were listening to the audio version, I was air quoting clinic. Clinic used very loosely for the record. But like some of you come in and be like, oh, like I want to use my benefits. Like I have a bad neck and then you do like personal training or something, which is like, yeah, like it doesn't work like that. You can't do that. Cause I think that I also developed a reputation. A lot of people were like, oh, Hey, like I have this benefit and that benefit. Can I, can I like buy a whole bunch of sessions and then like you bill me and then I get a receipt and I, re and I submit it. I'm like, that's called fraud, man. Like, I don't think you could do yeah. that. <laughs> but like people well, did. And then what would happen is like, they would, they would bill it and then they would get a receipt. They would submit it. They would get the money back. Sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. Or they'd be like, oh, you billed my benefits four times. Why do you keep doing this? Like what's happening? And then people would just get angry. And like, so the last thing you want to do, if you're listening to this is, screwing over your customers is really not a good way of doing business in the long run because you're not going to have a lot of repeat business, you know, fool, fool you once, shame on, shame on you, fool you twice, shame on me, as they say. But um, definitely working there was like working in the wild west. It did prepare me for, you know, working in like bigger corporate environments. Cause it, the other thing I would say is like, I've learned how to do, you know how to do business or like how to talk to people and those it's sometimes it's not necessarily the job itself i've had this conversation with aaron before so it's not necessarily like the the environment or like the job itself it's the skills that you learn in that environment like um like you're doing construction you learn certain skills there or like even just like how to talk to people or how to handle different situations you learn that as well that's something i I learned there and I also learned, you know, like, Hey, like I have a lot more to learn than just like, you know, like what I see on T nation or whatever, like things are online because every, everybody's different. Every situation's different. Well, yeah, I, for sure. Again, for these, sure. So, so what I've learned over the years and especially, and these are all alleged stories. So I, I can't say that they happen. <laughs> alleged. Hearing the names from... have been changed <laughs> to protect the innocent. So alleged stories, but um, 
as far as like when they look at like uh, orientations and all that kind of stuff. So in an orientation that they used to do at this establishment was basically kind of like, let's kill the person and then sign their credit card for them. Where I think they would walk in <laughs> basically, okay, well, what's your age? Okay, we're going to do your age and push-ups. What's your weight? Okay, you weigh 150 pounds. You're doing double your weight in, in leg presses. And then as far as a run goes, you're going to put you on a treadmill. We're going to run you as fast as you can. Like these were like legit screening processes that they would have individuals on until they literally try and kill this person on the fitness floor. Hello, I have a heart like, condition. Oh. Get your ass on the treadmill. I don't <laughs> want to hear your fucking excuses. Oh, basically. And it's like, okay, you're at 35% body fat. Lift the shirt up point at the body fat at the individual look at that you're gonna die <laughs> look at that you're days. disgusting you just that. like oh my god away. <laughs> like basically have people crying in, a, in an orientation or a discovery process with these people and basically okay perfect let's go to the room let's talk about your plan moving forward like i don't have any money you're not leaving here until you sign this paper you're gonna die unless you do personal okay. training like, hold on Aaron. Are, hold like, on yeah okay so time, time so, out so, Aaron. time so out that's, a, that's did you work? Did you also work at Premier? <laughs> I didn't. These are alleged stories I've heard. Alleged. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I want. That's what I wanted to know because there's like rumors that the person would be almost locked in the room during the sales process and almost not allowed oh, yeah. to leave until they purchase something. Look at yeah, me in the camera. Know. For for the record, I never did that. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> never did that <laughs> no like oh, these are like the, and again i i know this stuff still happens out there like at, depending on the facility obviously whether it's a private business or whatever and it does put and then again it's put a huge stain on the the idea of the fitness industry as far as a personal trainer goes because it goes okay you are a money grab you are just here to take my money you've got I can't work out that's great you've now proven that to me I've already heard money this I will fat shame you as you're doing basically girls. like like and, that, and that, that was a big thing where people were like I'm not comfortable working out with a personal trainer I've been sold before like people know when they're being sold right so like and yeah. that's it's put trainers and fitness professionals and again in a spot where they have to earn again you have to earn your consumers trust again right but again that comes to obviously learning how to customer again it's, there's a tr there's always great trainers but can they be great service people as well right you have to have a super super knowledgeable individuals but sometimes they're just awkward as fuck right but they're super smart but how can you merge everything where it's like that personality and bringing everything together? And how do you get that relationship to have a, a proper clientele? You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I, I feel like what you just said is like the accumulation of what you call like almost like your superstar trainer that can combine that knowledge piece with that personality piece, put it all together to a well uh, packaged um, service, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, that's not the easiest thing to come by, especially when it comes to personality piece. Like how do you teach that? Right. Someone can become more knowledgeable over time, but how can someone be like compassionate, empathetic and all that kind of stuff? Um, if it's not within their personality to be like originally. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. that that's, that's a tough thing. For it's a sure. tough thing. It's uh, as a saying goes at a, a facility. It's you want to be, you know, functional, friendly, fun innovative, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> entertaining, and yeah. and enthusiastic, and empathy, and <laughs> <laughs> how does that saying go again? <laughs> Oh God, it's been too long, bro. It's been like too long. I remember every time that someone would visit from a, a high corporate office, I was either a told to hide in the corner in the back because every time I, I would have to recite that saying <laughs> or B it's you don't leave until you have this memorized. And then I, I would have to keep it in my phone. I keep my phone on me as I'm walking around. There's like, there's like a corporate guy looking at me. I like, Oh shit. I, I, I locked eyes with them. I, I, I completely turned the opposite direction. So they don't ask me what the, uh, the mission and vision is functional, friendly, innovative. Oh, yeah enthusiastic oh yeah 
other oh, I know. other adjectives yeah, all to that, describe. Yeah, yeah we, we don't we don't talk about that anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Aaron, no, but they Aaron explain that you beat, Aaron they, would beat me in the corner. Know it, know it, or you're not leaving. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I would no, start that... waterboarding me in the corner. He would put a towel over my head, <laughs> waterboarding shove it in my mouth, start drowning me. Know the say, know the mission and vision, or else you can't leave. You can't see Listen, your family. <laughs> I know what you're trying to do, but I really want to get to the main point of why we brought Jeff on today. Because I want to know why he's such a closet Trump supporter. That's what I want to know. Yes. Oh God! <laughs> oh God! And I know I you're rooting. Know you're, 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 you, you've been watching the news. You've been rooting for your boy all weekend, right? And he, now I don't know where you get this information the from. I don't know why you keep saying this. I thought you were just joking, but it's funny that you brought this up. No, I'm not a closet Trump supporter. <laughs> I am intrigued by the U.S. election, though, just because of its overall division of a nation right now. Because um, it's pretty crazy. Like, I've been kind of keeping up with the polls right now, and it's kind of it's kind of crazy how close it is. It's almost to the point where whoever wins, like, is there really a is there really a winner right now with this whole division? <laughs> Someone is going to be pissed off either way. <laughs> Well, that's what I mean, right? So I was getting to be pissed off, and uh, it is what it is. It, it, it's crazy. But, uh, yeah, keeps me entertained. Honestly, like, the way I see it is, like, this may be the greatest professional wrestling match outside of professional wrestling. I think you just need Trump to show up and hit Biden with a chair, <laughs> give him a stunner. <laughs> Yeah, and then Bernie, off the Sanders, crowd. Bernie Sanders comes out from underneath the ring and just starts and just bombs. starts clean. And then the Republicans come in, and then here comes, by God, it's Bernie Sanders coming to <laughs> the ring with a metal folded chair. He's cleaning house. Oh, he accidentally oh hit God. Biden. He doesn't have dementia anymore. <laughs> oh, there's Pence. Pence is coming down from the rafters. He's coming down. Oh my God! Exactly though, exactly how. That exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, exactly but no, but yeah, no, yeah, no. It's tight though. I keep watching. It's tight, but uh, yeah, like in this scenario, who really wins? Really, really. I think but what's yeah. funny is that like I've seen so many different conspiracies through the last like three days where it's been ab- so have you heard about jeep jeep on both sides on both political sides as well not even just one it's it's all over the place it's all over yeah. the map literally so, all like, over the map <laughs> but like there's the newest one is like jeep gate so at one of the um rallies that biden had for like the not an acceptance sheet but like hey we're winning blah 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 blah, blah. and it's like it's just all Jeeps because everybody's like social distance in cars and whatever. And they're all in Jeeps, like 2020 Wranglers and uh, um, like the gladiators and all that kind of stuff. And so like so the whole conspiracy is that he, they're being paid by Chrysler to go pay, pay like vote for Biden. And it's all corporate sponsorships and all this kind of stuff. I guess it's insane. I've heard so much stuff over the, the last couple of days. I'm just like, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, oh he's, probably getting, he's probably getting some uh, Wrangler money, if you if you know what I'm saying. I, I don't know. I would think Trump would be more like a built Ford tough guy myself personally, but I don't know. Maybe as a, he's maybe getting some of that Ford F one fifty money. I don't know. I doubt it. He's not. I don't think he's going to win Michigan, so it doesn't matter. And that's where all the Ford plants are. That's where all the Ford. I think he lost are. Michigan already. I, yeah, I thought I, he lost well, that already. They're still counting. <laughs> They're still counting the uh, the magical three hundred plus thousand votes that showed up from. <laughs> oh my god! There's that whole conspiracy as well. Yeah, I know. Like, there's so much stuff going on right now, and it's like some places are just like Nevada. It just seems to be like counting at a snail's pace. Like, my god. I've also heard a conspiracy theory with that is they're still taking bets on the election, and they don't oh, want to close oh, betting. They want to collect out. money first, and then. 
seal it off. <laughs> so that that's, oh, so, a, so, that's so it's, uh, it's all Vegas now. So it's Vegas because Nevada is, I think, one of the only states left to to still count yeah and no they're taking money on the election because it's been a slow year because there hasn't been a lot of sports betting mm. yeah think about it's it it's also like ohio pennsylvania and all that kind of stuff like but no like no nevada's going at a snail's pace like where everyone's like like 99 complete then you got like nevada no, city yeah. at 76 for Je- whatever Jeff reason Drake. like it. yeah you Jeff know is so it's like right also the earth's flat <laughs> look into it you ever look into those uh flat earth theories <laughs> no i don't <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I can't do it i'm not gonna waste my time with that but the funny thing is is that and this is like the danger of youtube because basically anybody can again if they could speak intelligently enough you know put up a good video together right and edit it properly you can kind of make yourself sound smarter than you really are with a crazy theory Right. You're right, Aaron. And there's us that were, eh, you know. Yeah, we're, exactly. We're, eh. Here we go. <laughs> and then there's us. Like, I don't know. We just we just talk and stuff. But yeah, I don't know. There's the also the YouTube rabbit hole of hey, I'm gonna watch uh this political thing, and then it's like, oh, now I'm watching puppies. How did I get here? <laughs> Two hours later. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> No, for sure. You get deep dive into a rabbit hole for sure in anything. Especially conspiracy theories. Yeah, that can go pretty deep. Very deep quickly. All of a I sudden, will say uh, shout out to yeah. Joe Rogan and the uh, put and the shout out to Joe Rogan podcast for the uh, election night coverage, which is always golden. <laughs> well, so it's saying that Georgia is now tied. So Biden and Trump are tied in Georgia. North wow. Carolina. Oh my God! Trump. Trump is Trump is ahead in North Carolina from fifty to fifty percent to forty eight point seven, and then Joe Biden is no, sorry, in Pennsylvania, Donald Trump is up forty nine point eight percent to forty nine percent, so just in point eight percent lead, and then Nevada is forty nine point four percent to forty eight point five percent, and they're only at eighty four percent recording still. I'm just like, how? Oh, my God. And then Alaska is at 50% reporting, but it's 62 to um, 33. And they still have it as, like, uh, like in the air. <laughs> cow. The, the, <laughs> like, pol- the polar bears haven't hibernated seriously. yet. They need to come out. And cow- seriously, Alaska, Alaska is, like, <laughs> will never go Democratic anyways because they're out there. So they, they'll, they'll always they're be there. a red state. You people in Alaska – what do you mean, you people? Oh, my so, God. yeah, I, I, I have no idea how. Yeah. So, like, Georgia's a mess. Pennsylvania's a mess. Everything's a mess right now. Like, I don't know. But they're even saying it's like, even though if Trump does lose, and it, which is very possible, right, he's not going away. Right. Like, you, they're still going to hear from Trump. Like, when it comes to, like, the litigation, everything that's going to happen moving <laughs> forward. I'm not, not leaving. He's not leaving. And I guess. Yeah. No, he's not going to be silenced by any means. Right. Like, yeah. his Twitter is still going to go off. Like, he's not also exactly. just going to disappear. And uh, right. those Trump supporters won't be silenced either. They're going to be vocal. Like, it's going to yeah. be a thing that kind of keeps going on. Yeah. I think the one thing that's just sad is just like, there was no, cause everybody was like, okay, we want change. We want this. We want that. And it's just totally split down the middle. Whereas again, it's a 50, 50 election as it looks like compared to if it was a landslide for Biden, then you could say, okay, Hey, the, the vast majority of individuals want to go this direction. Right. And then you can kind of move on. But yeah, if, it's a bl- if it's a blowout either way, then like there, there's really no dispute. Like if, you know, if somebody wins like an absurd amount of electoral college seats, there's not much you can really say at that point where it's like, oh, this was rigged. That's rigged. It's like, what, well, dude, you lost by like 50, 20. It's like 50 plus electoral votes. So, yeah. Like, but unfortunately, yeah, since, saying, it's, right? since it's so close. There's going to be uh, some very unhappy people either way, how this goes down. So yeah, for when sure. we look at, so, so kind of like reeling it back into like more like 
obviously kind of what, what you really do, but not actual politics. So I apologize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no um, worries. The, big, the biggest thing where it's like, when we look at like recovery, that's a big thing, right? So when we look at like manual therapy was a big one that you kind of like, again, actually adjusting people to kind of build off that. When you look at like range of motion, especially when we look at like whether it's group fitness or even like jujitsu, because obviously these guys and athletes need these ranges of motion. How important is it to add these types of things into that repertoire? Well, I think every athlete, if you're an athlete and you train and you compete, um, for sure you should have some form of team back in you like uh some sort of trainer therapist strength conditioning coach whatever oh within your means like literally to keep you healthy because what athletes do uh isn't normal you know if you perform in the sport this is why the uh field of sports medicine uh, exists is because what you do is kind of a little bit out of the ordinary right um so for somebody that specializes in this world uh you know rehab injury prevention like i'm the first person to say hey as a trainer i don't have all the answers but as a specialist and someone who feels at their you know a professional and an expert i'm going to make sure i'm associated within my network with as many people as i have that i feel that could benefit the individual the athlete or whatever because you know um I, i can't do chiropractic adjustments i'm a personal trainer i can't do that but i see value in that i can't do acupuncture but i see a value in that so if i on the basis of my assessment if i'm looking at somebody um uh i could definitely gear them to what direction i feel is best suit for that person um but if i'm an athlete then i'm definitely considering all these things because you got to think about your performance and your longevity right if you're someone that wants to do what you do for a long period of time, you, you better have these people backing you to keeping yourself healthy. Cause literally what you're doing in, in like, let's say jujitsu is uh, make yourself vulnerable to compromise uh, joint positions. Right. Um, because you don't tap out in comfortable positions, right. Like <laughs> in, in jujitsu. So uh, with your training, either on the mat or your strength and conditioning and everything, uh, to make sure you're in pristine form and all that kind of jazz, you got to make sure you have all these things uh, in place in order to keep your longevity and performance like on top. What are some suggestions when it comes to like specific um, specific sports or like Brazilian jiu-jitsu and like uh, different things that you can do to take care of your joints? Like what would you recommend to uh, somebody practicing out there? Okay, so for anyone practicing, like for me personally, if I were to have a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu athlete, then I'd go watch a lot of video and a lot of tape uh, to see what they do. They have a full understanding of what they do, what strategies they utilize and all that kind of jazz, because I'm going to want to know uh, what specific ranges of motion that I want to strengthen, right? Uh, in terms of what you call uh, active range of motion. Like Aaron, I know you did like functional, functional range correctives and all that kind of stuff. That's a lot of active range of motion stuff. Like in the industry, there's a lot of emphasis of passive range of motions. Like where can someone take a joint position? Like what I do with people on the table is a little bit more of that passive range of motion stuff. So where can I go and take, let's say this shoulder joint. I'm passively moving someone's shoulder into position, right? But there's a difference between what someone can do passively and actively. So where can someone take that joint position themselves, right? Sometimes those two things don't add up. And that's where problems arise. So where someone doesn't have the strength to control in a certain range of motion, you know, someone can take them there or they can't take themselves there. So if they can't take themselves there, then technically they're weak in a certain range of motion. Then that needs to be strengthened, right? So... For someone in the whole Brazilian jiu-jitsu world where you're using various ranges of motion and you guys, you have your own certain holds, you know where to take somebody if you want them to tap, they would want to know, okay, what is their capacity at a certain position and what they, can they sustain? What kind of force can they generate in that area? And if it sucks, then you want to find strategic ways to strengthen that, 
You know what I mean? Um, and if they don't have the passive range or the active range, then you want to be working on those two things. So really, um, for someone in that sport, depending on how serious they are, you know, aside from doing their own personal like mobility routines, like working some with someone specifically to do an actual movement analysis and actually do some table work, work with them and see and actually be able to test where they're weak would probably be the best bet for that person. Yeah, I think you mentioned like what, something that's very important when we look at like passive range and then active range, right? Where especially like, again, you putting that individual into the passive motion because they weren't able to go there, but then becoming strong in that range now that it has, is active space. So especially for like jujitsu, for example, if I was an arm lock, for example, so that's going to be at end range. So you put that person in a passive end range of motion, are they actually strong within the joint range to kind of build off that? So when you look at, again, you said capacity, it's like building, and that's where like active like range and again, where I look at like through FRC, where that building that end range motion and strength and capacity is so important because the passive side is like getting the actual movement of the joint. So it actually moves properly, which is something you need to do, but then it's okay. How do you train it to stay in that joint and still stay strong? Because if it keeps going into those joints, does it actually have any strength because it's never been there before? Yeah, absolutely. And also looking from a prehab and injury standpoint, like in my years, there's a lot of like protocol based stuff. You know what I mean? If you want to strengthen your rotator cuff, then you do like low elbow, high elbow, external rotation and stuff like that, which is all fine and dandy when you want to train or teach a large population of people. But in the end of the day, you got to be training the joint position that you're going to be in strengthened specifically because um, the, ch the chiropractor of mine, uh, Dr. Ken Kanakin and Briars would know Dr. Ken Kanakin because he's been to the Swiss conference, you know, he'll treat the person specifically to the range of motion that they're doing. And so if a golfer has pain or, dis or dysfunction within a certain range, or they feel something weird, He'll trade, he'll, he'll percuss the person in the, in the end range or whatever position that they're in that they feel it. It's very, very, very specific. And if you're looking at treatment or you're looking at the uh, training or whatever, you got to look at those things. You know what I mean? Uh, you can't be doing low elbow external rotations to strengthen your rotator cuff if you're finding your pain or discomfort or whatever you're finding when your elbow is in elevated position. Like if it's above the shoulder, for example, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You got shoulder pain there. Like you have to be tackling it and testing these, the muscle capacity and those ranges of motion, right? It has to be very, very specific. And, um, and, and working the tissue, if you get soft tissue therapy in those specific areas, because it's funny uh, when I did his course, Briars, I don't know if you did exercise muscle testing. Mm -hmm. uh, if I did. you did, if you did do that course, you'd know that all the muscle testings are specific to st specific exercises in the gym. Because if you look at classical orthopedic muscle testing, um, if you're testing the pec, for example, you have the arm straight in front of the body, uh, uh, ab horizontally abducted and internally rotated. Like who the hell bench presses like that? Your arm fully turned in and you're doing bench presses. No one does bench presses like that. <laughs> so you can test strong in that position, but all of a sudden you do a bench press position, you could test weak. You know what I mean? So it's almost uh, a false positive. And when you're looking at people and I'm working with uh, the rehab or injury prevention, it's, it's, you gotta look at the full needs analysis of the person of what they're doing, watch what they're doing, understand fully and, and, and make your decisions from there. You know, but um, I, I, I can't tell you enough how much it drives me up the wall and wild when, um, when people let's say, say I have a complaint, I have a hip complaint. My, my hip or back hurts when, uh, when I do something. Okay. So someone just say, let me, let me do a, a squat movement screen. Let me see you do a squat. They do a squat. You know, they see a person do a squat, like three squats or whatever. And they go, yeah, okay. Your glutes tight. This is what you do. You cannot tell me that from watching the person squat and the knee kind of moves in or out or whatever, that, that, that you already know what the issue is without doing further testing or an investigation. 
Like it, it drives me out the wall. There's so many reasons why something could be happening. It could have happened at the ankle. You're not testing any further. You know what I mean? And how do you know that, it, Jeff? How do you know huh? that? I mean, this I person's why? really good and they work at Premier and they know these things. <laughs> <laughs> I know oh, all man. and see all. No, I will make you no. throw up and sign this contract because you're yeah. going to <laughs> <laughs> No, but for real. No, for real. Like they'll go look at something and think they have MRI vision and know exactly what's going on. And it's just like, well, no, like there's so much further investigation into these things. And, um, and you know, at, at times, you know, trainers have all the answer. A trainer shouldn't have all the answer, but a trainer should probably know where to direct somebody. And there's things you can learn to, 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 uh, to figure these things out, you know, whether someone actually needs to see a chiropractor or someone needs to see a massage therapist or a physiotherapist, you know what I mean? And then build from there. So you have a good collaborative network and then really think about the client care of that person to get some result. Because a lot of therapists, like my sister is a massage therapist for like 15 years. She knows when she has some gym person and who is to have a back problem, she knows she doesn't have all the answers. She knows the person needs to do more work by the time they're off the table, right? Because then the person's going to come right on back. Like that's where that network comes in, where you got to work collaboratively as a trainer to know, hey, th these are the different specialties out there. These are your options. And that's kind of what I do um, as someone that is not just, you know, doing uh, mobility work with people and stability work with people is actually at times being like, you know, you know I don't have the answer for that. And I'm not even in a position to diagnose. You're coming with me saying, yeah, I have shoulder pain. First thing I'll ask is like, have you seen a licensed therapist first to actually diagnose that? Because I don't know. I have no idea how to diagnose that problem. You know, if they say no, I'll tell them to go there first. Once you get that, then come back to me. And then we can start working on the game plan as it, as it should be. So um, for athletes and uh, everything like that, like, you know, I, I do the same. But um, yeah, that's just kind of like my viewpoint on things. One uh, one of the last important questions I wanted to ask you this weekend: Who is more, or, or actually to this evening, I, I should say, who is more crippled since you've worked on both of us, me or Aaron? Oh my gosh! Let me let me think. Briars, I think you had a long, long list. I think <laughs> I think Aaron has a specific list of problems. I think you had a more extensive list list of, of of problems actually like mike what's wrong with you like, how much time you got <laughs> yeah exactly that that was that was your thing where aaron seemed to have more specific things yeah um, mine was just like my shoulder which has been an issue for years and then it was like my left hip at the time was starting to get all wacky for some reason because it was throwing my back out that's what it was so i had like yeah. had to slowly start working on that but yeah, yeah. But the thing is funny with, with, with athletes and something, you're not going to stop doing what you're doing because the best thing you could do for your sport is train, right? You could do your strength and conditioning, but you eventually have to keep practicing and training, right? So for athletes and stuff like that, it's, it's a lot has to do with like uh, just maintenance, almost trying to keep things as healthy as possible because you're going to do what you're doing. Like I said, the, what you do isn't necessarily... Uh, normal or in a say healthy because it's in the realm of sport. I remember I was doing an MAT course with a guy alignment for the for the Baltimore Ravens, and I don't know how I got partnered with this guy because he was like freaking six nine and he was like three hundred pounds, and there I am uh, being muscle tested from this guy like on the table like. <laughs> He's like snapping I, I don't care how much little force he would fucking implement, I would fail every test. Anyway. So we were watching there was a football game on, on tv and he's just like honestly there's no fucking player on that field that isn't injured you know everyone's fucking injured on that field right but everyone's trying to freaking maintain recover and do the best they can or play, play the high level right so with whatever you're doing right it, it has to do a lot with doing the best you can to maintain yourself uh to meld the training as well as the 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 competing together to keep yourself as healthy and fit as possible, right? Um, that's just the nature of the beast. Yeah, no, I, I remember I had um, a guy working with us at one point, uh, shout out to Marcellus Bowman, because he was working with us for a long time. He was uh, um, 
can't remember what position he played, but he played for uh, Hamilton Tiger Cats. He was playing for Winnipeg uh, Blue Bombers at one point, and then he was working with us. And he used to tell me about like the drugs they used to have, like before practice, during practice, after practice. And I was just to get through practice. Like there was like, okay, you got to take three of the blue <laughs> ones, two of the red ones, <laughs> one of the purple ones. Like just and and then they would give you a cortisone shot, and they would do this, and they would do that. Like that was their protocol, and then that was just practice. That wasn't even games. And like in games, you're amped up X amount, much more. So and again every single player on the field and it's not to say there's an issue in sports or anything like that that's just an, like you said the nature of the beast but all these guys are hurt right so it's just like recovery is such a big thing and it's just like okay how do you and that's why the the, the best do it where they spend a million dollars a year on physical fitness right like lebron james and even like russell wilson like these guys are spending money on physical fitness to make sure that they can play at high level for as long as they can doing what they do. Right. I mean, in jujitsu, that money is not that big. So these guys can't do that. So they have to outsource these things a little different, but I think, you know, and as time goes by, as athletes, the sports in general get bigger, they're going to have to resort to these things. Yeah, for sure. So when it comes to uh, athletes and preventive injury and kind of stuff like that, um, I would say a lot of them outside of their sport would have to literally, if, if depending on the situation, the person like really kind of invest, if you don't have the money, you have to invest the time to, to learn a lot of the prehab techniques and stuff like that. Like there's a lot of resources out there, you know, nowadays, like knowledge for the most part of a lot of things is, is, is free, but uh, you had to put in the time, the time to learn it. You know what I mean? Um, in order to keep yourself uh, healthy and keep yourself able because uh, the body, you know, after it's wear and tear, it's like, you know, sometimes it is like a bad hit or whatever. And then that just like sends you off, you know, but a lot of times it's like the straw that breaks the camel's back, you know, after so much repetitive stuff, then all of a sudden something finally goes, you know, most of these things as they wear, they go a lot unnoticed and that's what, what ends up happening, right? with a lot of people, but uh, being proactive and all that kind of stuff and, and trying to understand the body a little bit more could be one of the best things for, for athletes and jujitsu athletes and, and all that jazz. Because I tell you, like um, when I, several conferences and stuff I've gone to when you're learning about injuries and stuff, like when it comes to the compensation process, like when you get an injury um, and this is the thing that, uh, that, some people really overlook is just general postural and gait patterns. You know, how do you walk and everything like that? If you sustain like a major injury or shoulder, or ankle or knee or whatever, one of the first things that gets compromised is your posture and then your gait. You know, like if you, even if you hurt a shoulder, you know what I mean? You're bearing down that shoulder and then your everything's adjusted. You know, you don't have a shoulder swivel. You don't, you're, you're you have a shortened, stride pattern and all that stuff in your gait and that's when the compensation patterns even start happening so things start turning on things start shutting down and the body's right re rewiring itself so your gait pattern's all off and then the body's right doing that compensation forget about doing your sport and, and and that exercise just from your posture and your gait is really getting really screwed up so a lot of things from my my chiropractor uh, dr ken Kanaki and his mentor dr david leaf will well, pinpoint, they'll just watch people walk and try to reteach people's gait patterns because they can adjust per well, some person all day long, you know, get them all reset, do the muscle tests and all this stuff. They're strong all of a sudden. They get off the table. Uh, their body ain't moving uh, regularly as it used to, even from its walking pattern. They're still work walking with short stride, toes outwards, you know, shoulder swivel ain't there, you know. So all those stuff starts getting reversed right away. Like he's, he's, he's done it. I've seen him do a live, live chiropractic adjustment on somebody with an injury, fixes it all right up. The guy takes like 10 steps off the table, goes back on and then retests some of the joints that are weak again. You know what I mean? So even from a grassroots level for, for athletes to look at themselves or anybody that has sustained an injury, you know, you got to look at certain things. Uh, for me, uh, especially uh, with somebody that had like multiple left ankle injuries, like I, 
I could totally see why, you know, my right hip is off and everything like that from a weird compensation pattern, just because I have limited range of motions on my left side and all that kind of jazz. And it doesn't matter how many unilateral exercises I do, you know, single leg squats or whatever, you know, if I don't adjust my gait pattern, if I don't have comfortable weight transfer to my left side, just from walking, you know, a lot of these things are going to retighten and reinforce, right? It's something that's really, really overlooked with a lot of people um, that I've had a huge um, respect for now. Uh, a lot of people on the table, um, when I work with them, when you talk about past injuries and stuff, I'll always look at things like the, the foot and all that kind of jazz, you know, because I watch them walk and everything like that. And I started working a lot with the foot and everything. And being the first person that ever worked with my foot, and see a lot of transferable benefit uh, for, for other places, a lot of jazz of uh, the back, the hip, shoulder, or whatever, um, working on these extremities and stuff. Um, but um, it's one thing for sure to be considered for athletes is actually kind of going back to a little bit of the basics, looking at just regular mortal movement and having an understanding uh, how compensations really work and how they can affect in the long term for, for, for an athlete. Because uh, it doesn't necessarily have to uh, be affected from the actual sport activity that you do. It could just be from stuff that you're not even thinking about. How many times have I worked with somebody's neck and shoulders? You know, who has had, I have one client freaking had chronic neck pain, seen several, several therapists say, I can't figure out what's wrong with your chronic neck pain. I was the first person to ask him about their fucking pillow. So what's your pillow height at, man? <laughs> your posture's kind of shit. Like, is it high or is it low? He's like, oh, I sleep with a low pillow. Like, why don't you try leveling your head out because your posture sucks? So it's a little bit of a neutral position. Goes back within a week. Says, oh, Jeff, my neck hasn't felt better. I didn't do anything special. <laughs> I told him about his pillow, for God's sake. And all that is from but pillow. It's these... Yeah, but it's like no one had seem to ask and it's it's just these little things you gotta you gotta you gotta know so a lot of people's injuries sometimes in sports come from vulnerabilities that maybe came from something far from the past which is why doing a nice client intake with people is really 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 helpful because i'll ask like man have you i don't care how young young you were you you messed something up like you know was that addressed did you see a physio the answers are no i'm gonna look at it These are things that are very important to ask and not making people do, you know, triple their body weight on a leg press and and things like that. That's a normal screening. It's a normal screening tool. What do you mean? Uh, Do do burpees until you throw up. What are you talking about? That's part of the assessment. Sign this paper. It'll be $12,000. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Jeff, uh, before we wrap up tonight, I want to ask you what's uh, what's next for you in the future. Like, what do you, where do you see yourself in, in the next like year or two? Like, are you going to continue with virtual training? Are you going to be, uh, you know, are you going to decide, hey, you know what, I'm going to go to RMT school. Stay tuned. Yeah, there's like several angles that I've been considering. Like with the whole PT thing, like obviously subjected to the times like I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing I'm enjoying with connecting with people virtually and all that kind of jazz uh, in which I may maybe launch just like my own platform and my own systems in which I've developed that help people you know not just uh, look at the I guess just the fitness part but the, the, uh, the prehab part of things as well as the mental game that comes with any transformation i'm trying to build that program I'm actually working with a coach trying to build that whole program out right now um but the future like even as things go on i may just jump into the whole athletic therapy field i know i was looking at that completely just being where i'm at right now um i i have a lot of fun learning about a lot of those things in that field and i know i'm limited as a trainer to some certain tools that i could be using uh, but, uh, and that may open some doors in that direction. If I tend to pursue more of that therapeutic field. Um, but right now I'm kind of enjoying what I'm doing, what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Like I'm, as, although this is not the most ideal for me, like I am grateful the fact that I can connect with clients still through this medium. I can still help a lot of people out. 
I had a little bit of doubts in the beginning about doing things uh, virtually as well, you know, not being in a, like a commercial facility with all the tools and all this jazz, but it just really just forced me to be a little bit more creative. So uh, thinking a little bit outside of the box, a little bit going to my grassroots, but you know, people are benefiting, you know, you're, you're, you're connecting with people, people are moving, people are feeling better. They're getting benefits because the other alternative if they're not comfortable going to the gym is they're doing nothing. Right. So I see myself as providing some form of solution to these people and um, people are taking into it. So uh, for the time being, I, I may be doing that as they try to figure out my alternative coaching business. Um, I was thinking of doing a podcast. I think I told Aaron, we do a podcast. I have no idea what subject I want to be talking about, but I do want to talk about a certain subject. You know, I just don't want to be talking to myself about random nothings for an hour. You know what I mean? So. I think it would be a highly entertaining <laughs> podcast. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are people that do that where they do solo podcasts and they just pick a topic of the day and, or what the news is. And they just like, Bill Burr does one that's really good, but like comedian yeah, podcasts. And he does one that's, I don't know, remember what it's called, but he does it every Monday. And basically it's just him and he'll just rant about stuff that's going on. And he does it for like an hour and a half, two hours. And it's hilarious. And it's like, again, no, he, it's he, he's that type of individual who can do it. Right. But I mean, like, yeah. if, if Mike and I can figure out the podcast game, I'm sure you can, oh, figure, you definitely it can figure it out. <laughs> yeah. No, but like, it, 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 it's funny. Cause I really got into the podcasting, like even listening to them recently, you know, I was listening to uh, like Joe Rogan. I was like to London real, I uh, was listening to, um, God, what's his name? Jordan Peterson. I was, I was listening to several like podcasts and stuff. That Wolf of Wall Street guy, John Belfort. Like I was, you know, just getting into it a little bit more. Some funny stuff like Bill Burr, uh, Basement Yard, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the reason why I consider it kind of resonated a little bit. Kind of getting out there, kind of speak my mind, you know, you know, I even got into it a little bit if I wanted like a mind dumpster a little bit on the little TikTok side, <laughs> just, as hey. a, just as a mind dumpster, like honestly, just to get some of the insanity out of those ideas that come through my mind, like just stuff like that. But like I was going to say, like, like your TikTok, like when you did it, you have like half a million views on one stupid thing where I, and that's why I like TikTok. <laughs> TikTok's algorithm is so fucked up and I just don't understand it. And it's just, You're just like jealous like, that he got all these views I am, and blew I up and jealous. you didn't like and never will. I, I think he's got a million views already and it's just uh, like shit in the bathroom. <laughs> no, it's over that much. <laughs> like it's literally over hard. shit in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is what yeah, we no, need to do on this podcast, Aaron, to blow it up. It's just shit in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, honestly, like, I don't understand it, but, like, there's some things in my mind, like, so, some random thought that'll come into my head where I'll think of a skit for it or whatever, and I'll just, I'll just throw it on there and see what happens, but, like, that, that that's just how my mind goes sometimes, it just goes a little bit crazy, but uh, yeah. in terms of actual, like, content and stuff, like, uh, maybe podcasting may be a thing. Um, but for sure, like, as I kind of work through these little projects and stuff like that, um, we'll see where it goes. But right now, um, I'm enjoying the virtual stuff. I get to work from home, which is something I've always wanted to explore, which I, um, which I actually get to now. Uh, the commute is awesome, so I can't really complain about that. <laughs> so yeah. I may just go well, continue on with that, Jazz. I think you should start a podcast. I think that's always a good thing to start with, um, especially if you got something to talk about. And again, like you'll, you'll figure it out. I think you should start a podcast. So I, I do look forward to that when you decide to do it. Maybe Mike and I can be honored to be a guest on your podcast. So I look forward to that. But Or, um, or I can just leave this podcast and go to yours, Jeff. What does that sound? <laughs> hey. It's okay. Maybe maybe this uh, this podcast will operate better. I don't know. We'll oh, crianch this podcast and go with Jeff because he seems yeah. to have some personality. But um, also, like, and again, like you were saying, like, 
whether starting that like um that curriculum and all that kind of stuff like there's a lot of avenues especially that individuals have, like yourself have chosen because they're kind of put in these positions and that that's kind of like the blessing about covid where it's been like it's given time to kind of reset really figure out okay everybody ends up in this hamster wheel and we're trying to figure out okay what the fuck are we going to do but now you kind of like get an opportunity like okay and we live in a good country where you've had that opportunity where you can do that compared to other places and worrying about putting food on the table the next day so i think you have to take whatever you got and kind of roll with it and this is the time to do it as they say right so you're young enough and you can do it so I do want to appreciate, I appreciate you coming on the podcast to really talk about that and share it. So. No, I appreciate you uh, having me on here for sure. But no, I totally agree. There's no real time. Like now, if you wanted to. Oh, I am the pivot. host now. Oh. I am the host now. And Aaron has logged out, but sorry, yeah, keep going oh. until he logs back in. There he is. Oh, there you go. No, I was just saying like, thanks for having me on, but like, he's right there's no time like now if you really want to leverage or pivot into doing something that's a little bit more more you right yeah than now especially if you're in also in 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 this industry like uh i encourage a lot of people as fitness professionals to be a little bit creative and start creating some content i know there's a lot of things in the industry to be kind of upset about but um you know, like the people that you're supporting still need to be supported. So uh, create some content, put yourself out there um, and st- keep serving because uh, people in our industry, that's kind of what we do. We serve others, we help others. And uh, like I said, it's, it's easy, especially when the, you know, that other little 20 day lockdown came around, you know, I was seeing a lot of, um, you know, uh, fitness professionals really pleading for the government to, to compromise with them, you know, and, and it hurts to see. But uh, uh, in our industry, we're strong individuals. Uh, uh, we lead the way in, in, in this industry and in this in this area of life. So um, it doesn't hurt to just try your best to stay relevant, keep putting content out there, try to kind of reinvent the things that you're doing and keep kind of pushing, keep kind of striving. Um, because, uh, I, I'm not saying here that I, during this time I haven't struggled, you know, mentally and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I haven't here had a little bit of an identity crisis, especially within the first like few months uh, of COVID, you know, going from like always going, serving mm-hmm. others, working professional to kind of like, you're going to sit on the couch for a bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, coming no, for sure. That. Um, so it's like, you know, you gotta, you gotta find other avenues uh like what you guys are doing here you know uh finding other avenues to put yourself out there develop content valuable content people could use and all that kind of stuff uh keep yourself out there you know find ways find ways because that's the only way uh you're gonna survive or else you're just gonna yeah you're just gonna dwindle like i was mentally dwindling after like the three month mark you know like i was just like i'm not really i don't i have equipment i'm like working out you know, I don't, I don't have anything, I'm not helping anybody, you know, so it's just like, fuck, if I don't do something, then I'm going to lose touch. What are you with doing everything. with your life, Jeff? What are you doing? Exactly. Yeah. After that first initial three month period where I thought, you know, I deserve a little bit of rest here. After that, I realized retirement wasn't for me yet. So I was like, I got to find something, but that's when this, the opportunity to virtual training landed on my lap, you know what I mean? um so it, it, it kind of all came together so i was able to kind of keep my mind engaged and yeah. that's what it's all about you know helping people connecting people and trying to make it through that's it all right i think we'll leave it at that right jeffrey i want to thank you very much for coming on this podcast tonight i do appreciate it. i wish you nothing but success but we're going to meet up soon anyways so we'll talk then all the right man, thank you very much the, the man the myth the legend Perfect. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.